Thank you. Um, just a quick uh, an announcement before I forget, because I know I will. Um, next week, well, this week is our last uh, class for this series on the attributes of God. Next week, we will be um, having equipping hour, but it's going to be on uh, discipleship. So uh, just as a reminder, what we do is whenever we finish a series, we have just a one-off uh, lesson on discipleship ministry, and it's and what it is is it's discipleship training. So if you're discipling somebody or being discipled, um, we want you to be here for that. This is training for that ministry specifically, and uh, so please make it a point to be here uh, next Sunday for our discipleship training. All right. Uh, well, before we begin, let me open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we open your word. Lord, what a wonderful time it's been uh, just seeing these facets of your glory, all these attributes, all these perfections of you, God. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, uh, this would just be a, a rich resource uh, for years to come in our own lives, so Lord, that we would look back on these notes, think back on these uh, lessons and these verses and these truths, and Lord, that we would be uh, greatly humbled, Lord, uh, by the fact that this God, who is so great and immense and so glorious, Lord, uh, has uh, shed his love upon us and sent his only son for us. Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us, Lord, uh, and help me, Lord, to teach your word uh, rightly and clearly, Lord, and even with passion and zeal, Lord, for your holy name. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So this morning we're looking at perfect, perfect, the fact that our God is perfect. Uh, what's interesting when we think about the attributes of God is that uh, uh, Charles uh, Ryrie, he says, attributes are qualities that are inherent to a subject. They identify, distinguish, or analyze a subject. And, but most theologies entitle uh, this topic on uh, uh, this topic that we're studying uh, as the attributes of God. Charles Ryrie says, I prefer perfections of God because all of the qualities or attributes of God are perfect. His attributes are his perfections. So we could have titled this whole series uh, The Perfections of God. Um, but uh, we went with attributes because I, I knew that I wanted to uh, have a lesson on the perfection of God. So that's what we're looking at this morning, uh, that uh, God is perfect. And it's going to be uh, a little bit of a reminder of some of the lessons that we went through uh, these past months. Uh, because we're going to see how each of these attributes, or some of the attributes, are um, um, in a sense heightened and brought to their full uh, glory as we think of them as being perfect uh, to the fullest and even be beyond our comprehension. Uh, so for us, we, we, uh, as usual, we want to start with the working definition of perfection. Uh, you should have it there at the top of your notes by Petrus van Maastricht. Uh, perfect, to be perfect, or these perfections of God. Uh, he just defines it as this. It is a universal perfection and sufficiency which includes every good in every kind and is sufficient for all creatures, for all things, all the way to infinite blessedness. Now, that's a mouthful. But you can kind of tell why uh, I was desiring to have this lesson on the perfections because what this brother does is he connects perfection with sufficiency. And that's really the essence of this lesson, is that uh, because God is all these things, and he's all of these things perfectly, his whole nature is perfect. There's nothing lacking in God. And that means, by definition, that he is sufficient. He is all sufficient for you, dear Christian. And so there's going to be that kind of thread, that theme through this lesson this interweaving of perfection and sufficiency because they go hand in hand. And um, this uh, Petrus, he uh, 
does this. He sees a connection here between perfection and sufficiency. And this is the idea that God has every good within him. In God is everything that is good. And uh, not just some goods, but in every kind of good. He is perfect in, there's every kind of perfection that there can be that is good is in God. And therefore he is sufficient for all creatures, for all things. And I love this, how, how he ends it. it he is per- perfect and sufficient for all peoples, for all things, all the way to infinite blessedness. He's everything that you need for this life and to, and, and to get you all the way to that enjoyment of heaven where there is infinite blessedness. He's everything that you need in this life and to take you into that next life. So, uh, first of all, we have uh, the fact that God is a perfect God. And that's one on your notes. God is a perfect God. This idea of perfect, we want to define that because uh, there's, there are words that are used, um, that are translated different ways uh, depending on the context. So you'll have one Hebrew or Greek word that's translated different things, perfect or whole or complete. Uh, we have that in, in Scripture. So we want to understand what we're talking about here when we talk about our God being perfect. So J.I. Packer says that the biblical idea of perfection, the biblical idea of perfection is of a state of ideal wholeness or completion. Ideal wholeness or completion. And he defines that or, or he elaborates more. In which any inabilities, shortcomings, or corruptions are eliminated or left behind. So it is this state of ideal wholeness or completion in which all inabilities, <clears throat> shortcomings, or corruptions are eliminated or absent or left behind. Uh, it is this idea of being whole or complete or full, not missing anything that is needed or good. That is our God. There is nothing that is needed or good that is not found in God. And that includes for your life, Christian. There is nothing, nothing needed for your life that God doesn't have. There is nothing good in your life that is not found in God. Uh, a, a few definitions from other theologians about uh, this perfection of God. Uh, J.I. Packer again says that the perfection is uh, what God says and does is wholly free from faults and worthy of praise. I like that positive side of it, worthy of praise. What God says and does is wholly free from faults and worthy of all praise. Uh, John MacArthur in his uh, systematic theology says uh, that God is absolutely perfect Disturbed by nothing within himself and encumbered by nothing outside himself. That's uh, one way that uh, is pretty unique with MacArthur. That he sees it as um, this quality of being disturbed by nothing within himself and encumbered by nothing outside himself. And then, of course, uh, Petrus van Maastricht. Again, the perfection and sufficiency of God is a universal perfection and sufficiency, which includes every good and every kind, and is sufficient for all creatures, for all things, all the way to infinite blessedness. All right. When we think about the perfection of God, uh, the I think uh, verse that probably most quickly comes to mind is Matthew five forty eight. <clears throat> Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we're going to talk about this first half here, that you are to be perfect uh, in, in a bit. But we want to first uh, understand just the statement here. Your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's see, these are, of course, the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who, if anybody knows 
God the Father, it's him. If anybody knows the depths of, the, of our Heavenly Father, it is the Son. If anybody knows if there would be any fault or any want in God, or anything lacking, or anything that's skewed in God, it would be that person that shares in the same nature, the Son. And this Son of God, with the full and perfect knowledge of the Father, says, Christian, your heavenly Father is perfect. There is no lack or want. There is no deficiency or inability or corruption in God. Very plain language. Now, the context of this is helpful, though. Perfect in what way? Well, in many ways and in every way. But here in the context, the verses right before this are in verses 44 and 45. He says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So you see, this perfection is a moral perfection, first of all. So God is morally perfect. That is, this quality about him that he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous that he is uh, gracious and loving to all. That's a moral decision. That's a moral act of God. God is perfect in his morality. His decisions to do good to both uh, evil and the good, to both the righteous and the unrighteous, that decision, that quality, that moral decision and moral uh, 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 call of God, as it were, that is perfect. He goes on to say, you need to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You need to be whole or, or full as your heavenly Father is whole or full. This love of God for both the evil and the good, both the righteous and the unrighteous, it is a whole or perfect love. And, and our call is to imitate our heavenly Father in that. So this quality of, of loving, uh, which is a moral decision uh, in God, is whole and perfect. Uh, also, Psalm 145, verse 3. Can somebody please read that for us this morning? Great is the Lord, highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So we looked at the uh, glory and the greatness of God uh, in weeks past. This is the topic here. Uh, great is the Lord, highly to be praised. That's his, that's his glory on display that, that pulls worship out of us in a sense. And what's, defi- what's uh, said here about his greatness and his glory, his immensity, and his infinitude, right? Remember we talked about that, his infinity, uh, is that that quality about him, that attribute is unsearchable. So his glory, his greatness is unsearchable. It is beyond human understanding, and it is beyond human discovery. You cannot find the end of it. And what that means is, is that it's perfect. His glory, his greatness is perfect. If you can find the end of it, if you can find the limits of his greatness and his glory, then maybe we could have, he could have been more glorious or great. And hence, he wouldn't be perfect, you see? And so, in saying that it is unsearchable, he's implying that it's perfect. And we have this quality of God, uh, this this unsearchableness or eternal um, aspect attached to these attributes. When that happens, uh, it's communicating a perfection of that attribute. And so that opens kind of a door to us, uh, to all these attributes that are defined in this way, are described in this unsearchable, inscrutable, infinite, uh, beyond, uh, or goes to the heavens, uh, all of these attributes that are described with those uh, descriptive words or phrases, 
uh, what is being communicated is that all those attributes, especially in the Psalms, uh, where it, this kind of language is used, all of those attributes are perfect. And you can just, I mean, just, just verses should pop into mind um, that do this. For example, here's another one. Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. And uh, so his understanding, we, we looked at knowledge or the omniscience of God before, right? Describing this, it is inscrutable. And that's a word that we don't often use today. Inscrutable. But this means that the knowledge or the omniscience of God, the understanding of God, is beyond searching. It's two words here. It's, it's a, it's a, it, it is a, the Hebrew word for uh, without or lacking, uh, and then the Hebrew word for measurement or searching. Uh, the idea that you can search and find out the limit. So it is without... Uh, it is void of a limit that you can search out, or it is without measurement. That's this word, inscrutable. So the knowledge of God is beyond searching. It is without measurement. Uh, in another verse that says the same thing. There's a few verses here that communicate this glorious truth is uh, Psalm 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. His understanding is infinite. And then uh, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 14 says, With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding and who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? There is nothing lacking ever in God's understanding, knowledge, or justice, or mind, where somebody helped him out and filled in the gaps for him. And so this, this truth is actually important because uh, it, it eliminates this uh, doctrine of middle knowledge. There's a doctrine of middle knowledge, and it's a, it's a geeky thing, but it's out there. Uh, there is no middle knowledge. What, what that means is that uh, middle knowledge is where uh, God knows all these possibilities of what will happen or what could happen, but he waits on man's free decision or actions to learn which possibility will become reality. Uh, that is uh, false. Uh, God does know all possibilities. He does know all, as it were, contingencies or, or uh, what could happen. But the difference here is that God chose one reality. Uh, God knows all possibilities of the future, but yet does not wait on man's actions or free will to, to figure out or to guide him into which possibility will actually be, become reality. Rather, the, 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 the truth is that though he knows all possibilities, he has ordained one reality. So there are no other you know, alternate universes or something like that. There is one reality. Uh, he is aware of all that could happen, yet at the same time has already decreed what will happen. Uh, this is the infinite, perfect knowledge of God, where he knows all possibilities and yet in his great wisdom chose one and planned one. All, all of history is simply the carrying out of the, of the decree and the wisdom of God. And so, Christian, what this means for you, a practical thing, um, is that whatever happened in your life or whatever is happening in your life was the best plan, right? 
because his knowledge and his decree and everything is perfect. And so there was no what if this didn't happen or what if this did happen in my past, my life would have been better. No, that's false. Because what did happen is what God decreed to happen and what he decreed to happen is perfect. You see how these, these we got to get through uh, and power through thinking through and understanding the doctrine of God. But then on the other side of that, there is rich truth for you to apply to your life, you see. Uh, this is why we teach the, these kinds of lessons, because it's good for you. It is good for you, Christian. All right, we got to keep going. I'm not preaching a sermon right now. Uh, Charles Hodge, talking about this middle knowledge, is, uh, he, he says this, but just before we leave it, because he says it better than I can. The, the kind of knowledge which this theory of middle knowledge supposes, um, uh, it, it supposes that, um, excuse me, this kind of, excuse me, th this kind of knowledge, this middle knowledge, uh, um, it, it, it cannot belong to God. Why? Because it is inferential. It is secondary. Where God kind of knows all possibilities, but he waits on man, and then he just uh, uses their choice uh, once they choose or once they uh, exert their power uh, to act. And then he finds out, okay, okay, that's, that's going to be the reality then. Uh, that cannot belong to God because it's inferential. It is deduced from a consideration of second causes and their influences, and therefore is inconsistent with the perfection of God, whose knowledge is not secondary or uh, dependent, but independent and uh, exclusive. Uh, one more uh, before we apply this stuff here. Psalm 103, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. So here, what's the attribute here in, in this verse? Loving kindness, yes, awesome. And how is that loving kindness described? It's great. And how great? How does it describe, how is this greatness described? I heard it. High as the heavens, as high as the heavens are above the earth, right? This is, this is uh, what's being described here as, as the great. It, and the point here, as I mentioned before, is that his mercy or his loving kindness is perfect. That's what's being communicated. It is beyond human perception is the idea. Uh, us as uh, finite human beings, uh, if there were a tower that stretches into the heavens, right? If we were able to build something or, or, or whatever, if, if there was something that was able to stretch from the earth and go into the heavens and go beyond our perception, uh, we would uh, tend to think it must just go on forever. There must be no end to it. And that's what's being communicated here. It stretches beyond into heaven, and it, and it goes past what we can even see. We just know that it keeps going and going and going. And so it is with the loving kindness and the mercy of God. It just, there's no end to it, and so it must be perfect then. Now, uh, for the application of this, uh, we go back to Matthew 5.48. Therefore, as, therefore, you are to uh, be perfect as your... Heavenly Father is perfect. So this is the command. So we must ask, how can I be perfect? I mean, I'm just a fallen sinner, right? I can't be perfect like this. The call here is to be whole or to be full. As your Heavenly Father is whole or full and perfect. The true and total perfection of God 
will be something that is always outside of our reach on this, in this life. Uh, a helpful text for this is Psalm, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 12 to 16. Can I have somebody please uh, read this for us? Uh, it's a large chunk, but can I have somebody please help us out? So you see here, um, thank you, sister, for reading that. Uh, uh, Paul says that uh, I have not attained this perfection. I have not obtained it. This, this, uh, this, I have not already become perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, but I press on, though, right? I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ, and that infinite glory in heaven. Uh, again, he says in verse 13, I, I, regard, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of that yet, that perfect, that perfect state. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards that goal. For the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus, I, I press on for that perfection. He says, let us, therefore, as many as are perfect. Well, I thought you just said that we can't be perfect. Wait. As many as are perfect have this attitude. And if, any, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So what he's saying here is that... Uh, there is an already not yet in the Christian life. Uh, we are made perfect and whole in Christ. And there are glimpses of this wholeness, not perfection, uh, as we would attribute to God in his divine perfection, but wholeness and maturity. Uh, there are glimpses of that in the Christian life today. But yet, as a whole, we can all admit and understand that we will never attain that absolute perfection that is not for this life but yet we still strive for more um, uh, more of that wholeness and completion and maturity uh, to be a reality in this life though it will not be absolutely perfect in this life uh, some help here from uh, MacArthur he says, the false doctrine of perfectionism, which is, uh, he says, th this, this doctrine of perfectionism teaches that there is some point following conversion when the believer's sin nature is eradicated. That's, that's perfectionism. But according to, the, to uh, this verse, uh, and especially in the Apostle Paul's treatment uh, of this subject in this passage, Perfection in this life is only a goal and not an achievement. We must pursue it, but we'll never attain it while on earth. Paul denied perfectionism by calling us to pursue a prize that can be fully obtained only in heaven. Uh, he says in verse 12 uh, that he himself had not reached perfection and, and re remember, he wrote to the Philippians nearly 30 years after his conversion. So this isn't, you know, newly saved Paul. Uh, he was per perhaps the most committed Christian who ever lived. And so if after 30 years he wasn't perfect, <laughs> you know, certainly none of us should claim to be. Uh, and this is the reality. Uh, 
and this is the, the truth, this is the, the uh, tension in the Christian life. The more godly you become, the more Christ-like you become um, in your life, the more you see how imperfect you are. And often, somebody who is newly saved thinks that, well, you know, the maturity isn't so far away. I can actually attain that. Uh, and and, and I, I can actually get there pretty quickly, I think. And that's sometimes the, the downfall or, or the shortcoming or the, uh, the, the pitfall of a new believer is they're prideful because they think that they are more mature than they actually are. But as God humbles them over time, uh, and as somebody grows in their faith and grows in their godliness and holiness, though they are more holy than they were when they first began, more sanctified than when they first began, yet uh, they, they, they come to realize, uh, I am more wretched than I ever thought I was. Uh, and so there is that amazing tension uh, in the Christian life. And we see that tension here with Paul, uh, a 30-year-old Christian, right? Having been a believer for 30 years and been in the ministry for years, having received instruction from Christ himself and revelation from God, been used by God so greatly, and yet this dear man says, uh, yeah, I'm, I have not attained perfection by any means. And actually what you see in his life, in his writings, he goes from, uh, you know, uh, from uh, the chief of, of sinners, he goes, he goes actually he goes from uh, the least of the apostles to the least of the disciples to the, chief, to the worst of sinners, he, as his life goes on, you see in his writings when he describes himself, it's, like, it's almost as if he's getting worse and more ungodly if, if we were just to take it at face value. But the reality is that he's, he's just more and more aware because he's closer and closer to his Lord. He's more and more aware of just how much of a sinner he really is. Though he is more godly, I think, than any of us. Um, and yet the, the call in this life is to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And so we can't just say, well, you know, Paul's never reached that. And so what hope do I have? I'll just, I'll just kind of do my thing. And I'll just kind of, you know, not strive for that perfection. No, we need to. We need to strive for it. Um, though you will always fall short, you must always strive and stretch yourself, Christian. You're not left let off the hook. The call upon our lives, from the words of Christ himself, the exertion of our souls, Christian, must always be to strive and stretch towards maturity, wholeness, and yes, perfection. So strive, work hard at it. And how does this happen? How do we do this practically in the church? Uh, Colossians 1.28 is a good example. We proclaim him. Who's the him? You just look back at the him, H-Y-M-N, of Christ. Uh, that is in Colossians 1, right? That glorious cataloging of the glories and the excellencies of Jesus Christ, Paul turns around and says, that's who we proclaim, that Christ, that glorious Christ. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom. And here's the goal, so that we, we may present every man complete in Christ. That word complete is the same word that is perfect in other passages. So he, he, so, so he says, this is how we mature men and women in Christ. This is how you will be whole, full, and mature. And get closer and closer to that perfect that Christ is calling you to. It is through the proclamation of Christ. 
teaching with all wisdom. It is the preaching and teaching of the word of Christ. That is how this happens. And notice uh, in Colossians 2, verse 9 and 10, this is, this is amazing. Though, Christian, you are never going to be perfect in this life, yet at the same time, there is this other side of this where you have all perfection in Christ. What do I mean? Uh, the same word in verse 9, in him that is in Christ, all the fullness or perfection of God, the perfection or fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Right, That's the incarnation. Christ is perfectly and fully God, though fully, truly man. Okay, that's what this verse is saying. The next verse says, and by the way, in him, in Christ, you have been made, it's the same word, complete or perfect. And he is the head over all rule and authority. So practically speaking, you're not perfect, but as far as your standing before God, as far as his estimation of you, uh, by which he will judge you, uh, family or enemy, friend or foe, sinner or saint, according to his judgment in the, in the, in the courtroom of God, you are complete, Christian. And it's only in him. It's not that we're not talking about uh, uh, you trying to attain this completion to earn the favor of God. No, in Christ, in him, you have already been made complete. And yet we strive for that fullness. So the, the idea is, in Christ, all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been made full. It's the same word. And so you, there is nothing that you lack, Christian, to stand before God and to, and to, uh, uh, to be counted righteous. In Christ, you have all righteousness. And you're, you're full. And yet, striving in this life to attain that fullness. To attain that fullness practically in your conduct. So you see, this, I mean, this is the Christian life. I, I am these things, but yet I need to be these things. Right? Uh, and, and that's a Christian life. That's what it means by work out your salvation. Like, these things are yours. You just got to do it. You just got to practice it. You got to let it out. You let, it, let it come out of you. It's there. You just got to do it. You just got to live uh, this fullness out. There's nothing that you lack. Yes. 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 That's right. To know that the, when we fall and fail, he will not abandon us because he still sees us as complete. Right? And so it is his kindness that leads us to repentance, isn't it? And it is this assurance that what he began in you, he will perfect, he will complete. Yes. Good. Any other thoughts before we move on? The last two we're going to go by pretty quickly. There you can see there's not as many verses there. So we have a perfect God, and this God, because he is perfect, he has perfect works. I love this. He has perfect works. Just a couple verses here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Can somebody please read that for us? Amen. Now, this is not Dwayne. <laughs> this is not Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> I, 
had to say it. I had to say it. No, this is, this is the infinite, glorious rock of Christ. Uh, and in, in the context, uh, Deuteronomy, they would understand this as that rock that always followed them around. That rock that was always there that was they drew water from. It was their fountain of life. And this rock, this God, it says his work is perfect. His work is perfect. His actions, all his deeds are perfect. And perfect in, in its justice, perfect in its faithfulness, perfect in, in his righteousness. He is perfect. All his ways are just, and he is a God of faithfulness, and he is righteous. In all these attributes, they, in all these actions, these doings of God, it's always right. It's always true. It's always just. There's no, there, there's no uh, action or decree of God where he, there could have been another better way. Uh, he always does the best thing. Samuel, 2 Samuel 22, verse 31. As for God... His way is blameless. His way is blameless. That's the idea of perfection. The word of the Lord is tested. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. This way, his way is blameless. What does that mean? Well, uh, it, it's, this is the Old Testament way of saying what the, how the New Testament talks about walk. So in Ephesians and uh, Colossians, uh, Paul says, uh, walk in a manner worthy, right? Uh, it, it has to do with your life, your conduct, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it is with God. The conduct of God is perfect. It is blameless. There's, there's nothing that God does or no, no way that God is, no character or quality about him, no tendency or deed or even manner or custom of God, as it were, no behavior of God that is uh, deficient or flawed. It is blameless. No accusation sticks to him. That's the idea of blameless. No accusation sticks with God. You can't blame him for something wrong. It's impossible because he is perfect. Now again, as children of God, we are to strive towards lives that are uh, full of, uh, that imitate our Heavenly Father, right? Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. How? Well, in, in your works, in your deeds. Strive, Christian, towards a life that is full of actions and deeds and manners and customs and behaviors that reflect the perfection of God. Yes, praise him for all of these things and rest in these realities. But that's your father. And you're called to be like him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the foulment of flesh and spirit, perfecting in holiness in the fear of God. Strive towards it. Yes, absolutely. Try, try and be perfect today. You're not going to do it. But there should be kind of this mindset. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it my all and try and be perfect. I know I'm going to fall short. I know that the grace of God is going to have to fill in all the shortcomings because I'm not going to do it. But man, that is the goal. That is the goal. And just as in God, let there be nothing that you do throughout the day where people can point to it and say, yeah, that was evil, that was wrong. Uh, you know, you could have done something better or uh, there, I can blame you for some evil or wrong. 
Uh, you should try and choose the best thing for each day. Right? Because there's a lot of good things to do in a day. Uh, and there's a lot of good decisions that you can make. A lot of good actions that you can carry out. Uh, but I believe it was Spurgeon that said that the difference here between uh, immaturity and maturity is is the immature chooses is able to choose between good and evil, uh, but the mature is able to choose between good and better. That's maturity. That's wholeness. What's the best thing that I can do today? What's the best choice here for me when it comes to uh, you know? Uh, my life, or my finances, or my family, or my ministry, or my job, or my education, my time. My time. Thank you, brother. What's the best thing? Sometimes uh, uh, we we choose something and we say, "Well, that's that's fine. That's that's not a bad decision. I didn't, you know, I I didn't waste my time on." outright sin but yeah you could have done you could have done something better with your evening last night i think maybe could you have done better well then learn from that and do better today I mean, that's the whole point that's the whole direction the trajectory of of godliness always trying to get better as it were more godly more holy more in its essence christ like than the day before. Any other thoughts? Questions? Got one more. Uh, the perfect word. The perfect word. I love this. Uh, a lot of the theologians in my studies went to this, so I, I, thought, I thought it fitting. Um, God is perfect in his essence and nature, and he, he, what he does, his actions are perfect, and uh, his, and so therefore, his word is perfect. The Bible that you hold in your hands, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, paper and ink or you know a screen, it is perfect. It is perfect. And this comes from many verses. A couple here, Psalm nineteen seven. Can somebody please read that for us? Amen. So the law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect. It's all that you need. And, and uh, this whole chapter is wonderful. I was talking to a, to a brother yesterday about this, actually. Uh, he's memorizing Psalm 19, the beginning of it. Um, the, the, first half, the first six verses of Psalm 19... Talk about the revelation of God in, in, in natural revelation. How he shows his glory in nature. But then the second half, beginning here, is the, the glory of God in special revelation, in his word. So God reveals himself in nature, but he most clearly reveals himself in his word. And so that self-revelation in the law, in the word of God, in scripture, is perfect. It's perfect. And I love in, the, in, in this, in this uh, passage, verse uh, 7, 8, and 9, it, it is uh, that the word is perfect and it restores a soul. Uh, it is sure, making wise a simple. Uh, it is right, rejoicing the heart. It is pure, enlightening the eyes. It is clean enduring forever, uh, and it is true, righteous altogether. So you see, it, it, it is these things, and it does these things. It, 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 is, it has this quality about it, for example, perfect, but that quality does something. And here, this perfection, this quality of perfection of the Word of God uh, bears out in your soul and what it does to your soul Christian 
Oh, dear, dear child of God, your soul is in daily need of nourishment and help. There, there are all different kinds of things that your soul will need on a day-to-day basis. Whether it's encouragement or guidance or comfort or hope or rebuke or teaching and a myriad more. Each day your soul, each moment, each passing hour your soul needs something. Uh, And what's being said here is the word is whole and full and perfect. There's nothing lacking. And so whatever your soul needs, it's there. It's there. And it is able to restore your soul. To, that is to make it whole. To, 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 to give it fullness of life. That's the idea of res- restoration. Isn't that glorious? Oh man, we, we need to not neglect our word, right? We need to not neglect the scriptures. Everything is there that you need, Christian. It is perfect and, and it is able to make whole. Uh, James one twenty five. One look one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, and this man will be blessed in what he does. You want to be blessed in what you do? Do you want to have uh, success? And I'm not just talking material success. You know you'll you know you'll have health, wealth, and 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 everything else, uh, because that's not promise. But by and large, uh, the, the rule of thumb is that you will have a blessed life. Whether that means that you're blessed with riches and you're not enslaved by those riches, or you're blessed with uh, just enough and you learn great contentment in that. Um, there's all different f- forms of blessedness in life, right? Um, but this state of being, just being blessed in all that you do, oh man, that's, that's a desire of all of us, I think. I don't think any of us want, don't want to be blessed today. Um, but uh, how does that happen? If you look intently at the perfect law. Notice it is a perfect law. It's the perfect word. The perfect law, the law of liberty. If you, if you gaze at it, if you, when he says look intently, that means Study, Christian. That means study the word, not just read through it. But read it and think about it. Read it and meditate upon it. And try and connect a couple dots in your mind. Read it and give it your full attention. Look intently at the word of God. And then do it. <laughs> right? And abide by it, right? That's, that's the other side of the coin. You got you to gotta obey it, right? You can't just study it and then not do it. That's, there are plenty of unbelieving, uh, quote-unquote, theologians and scholars. Plenty. We don't need any more. What you need to be is a scholar of the Word of God that lives it. Not being a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. Do something about what you see and what you study and what you meditate upon in the Word of God. If you do that, man, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed because you'll know what to do, right? You'll, you'll be able to, you'll be more and more able to choose the better and not just the good. That's the point. The perfect Word of God will and must accomplish its intended goal. Uh, what's its goal? 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That means perfect, right? It's, it's profitable for everything. It's all that you need in life, right? That's another way of saying it. it's perfect and whole, nothing lacking. Why is it that way? So that the man of God may be adequate. That is the same word, complete, perfect, or full. Uh, Equipped for every good work. That's why it is what it is. That's why the Bible, God made it what it is. So that you would be complete, Christian. 
Uh, and, and again, by reminder, we proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom. Right? We preach the word and teach the word so that we may pre present every man complete in Christ. That's the intended goal of the word of God, the perfect word. And so it, this perfect word of God will and must accomplish its intended goal. If it doesn't, if, then it must not be able to. And then it must not be perfect. So Christian, your, what's, what's your uh, calling? What's your great privilege in life? It is to let the perfect word, which is the perfect work of the perfect God, carry out its complete work in you. May you be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Um, I want to end with this verse and, and a quote from uh, one of my friends, old dead guy, <laughs> Petrus van Maastricht, uh, a Puritan in the, I think, uh, yeah, 17th century. Uh, I, I hope that this has been the reflection of your heart week to week and going forward, even launching out of this last uh, uh, lesson on the perfections of God uh, is this cry of the heart. Who am I, who, excuse me, whom have I in heaven but you? Besides you, I desire nothing on earth. If God is all that he says he is, why, do I, why would I go anywhere else, right? Why would we go anywhere else? Oh, may, may our hearts be drawn to him as a result of these things. Uh, he says here in his book, the perfection and all sufficiency of God provides us a foundation for our comfort. If we are uh, not sufficient for ourselves and the whole universe is not sufficient for us, since our soul by nature is endowed with an appetite that is entirely insatiable, then let us reflect on the fact that God is most all-sufficient, both for himself and for us. I like that. God is enough. He is so perfect that he's enough for himself. Right? Right? That is the infinite blessedness of God, that he is perfect for himself. He's good enough for himself to be infinitely delighted in himself. Well, he, he then, if he is enough for an infinite self, then he's enough for you. Amen. See? I love how these guys think. In particular, for you, Christian, if there are lacking any goods of the soul, such as force of judgment, of rightness, of will, faith, hope, love, moderation of the affections, or of the body, such as health, strength, and good temperament, or a fortune, such as uh, necessary resources, honors, and the favors of men, or if there, are, if there are threatened dangers which we are no match to ward off, if there are press against us any enemies, uh, whether it's Satan, the world, sins, or the consciousness of sins, our consolation can be, Christian, that God is all-sufficient and most sufficient. He is the one who is sufficient for himself all the way to infinite blessedness and according, accordingly is much more sufficient for you. If he is sufficient enough for himself, your measurement of need is infinitely less than his, right? You don't need as much as God does, as it were, to be in that state of infinite blessedness. Your cup is minute. He is enough to fill that. He's all you need, Christian. So go to him. Go to him in his word. Let his perfect word revive your soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself in these ways. Oh, Lord, it's much more than just head knowledge and information and data for us to get right on a test somewhere. Lord, this is good for our soul. 
I, I pray, Lord, that uh, the anchor of our soul, as it were, has increased in size and weight. That we are not tossed to and fro by the worries and the cares of this world. Oh God, we are so prone towards anxiety and towards depression, uh, towards hopelessness, towards being overwhelmed with life. God, may, may you be the all-supreme anchor of our souls. And I pray as a result of this series that you would have your perfect work. Make us complete. Make us mature. Men and women, so that we might be used greatly of you. So that we may stand strong in the storm. Lord, do these things and we'll give you all the glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just again as a quick reminder, next week is...